Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. Enjoy the video. Hey, what up y'all? Brad the Guitologist here. In this video, we've got a 1974 Deluxe Reverb, and I think this thing is mostly original. So we're going to take a look at it, uh, get inside of it, see what needs to be serviced. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, stick around. Okay, like I said, this is a 1974 Deluxe Reverb, and I believe this thing to be mostly original. It's in great shape, too. And these are just really, really good amplifiers all around. And still a bargain as far as vintage amps go. Uh, these Silver Face Deluxe Reverbs don't have too many differences uh, from any Blackface Deluxe Reverb models, really. Uh, they didn't change a whole lot on the Deluxe Reverb, so... I mean, you can usually get these uh, Silver Face Deluxes, which are essentially Black Face um, Deluxe Reverbs, uh, for a steal. And by a steal, I mean, you know, uh, definitely cheaper than you would pay for a modern boutique amplifier, which in a lot of cases would be um, just trying to clone something like this anyway. So one little point I want to make, the uh, logo, you can usually spot one of these transitional uh, Silver Faces by the logo. It's missing... It's missing the tail that comes around on earlier Fender logos. And it's also missing the Made in USA uh, little part that uh, came later. So this is, this is kind of the middle period as far as the Fender logo. Okay, so here's the rear of this thing. And like I said, uh, this thing is just clean as a whistle. Um, this is the original Utah speaker. And you can see the silver... Fender Utah logo there on the back. Just in really great shape overall. Uh, there is the code right there. 328 manufacturer code for 1974. What is that? The 23rd or 25th week looks like. Just in really good shape. Really good condition. Even the bottom of this thing is pretty good and clean. Usually a uh, you know, you'll find a lot of dust bunnies and things inside of one of these, but not this one. It seems to be pretty pretty well kept. We have a serial number here of 41053, if anyone's keeping score. That's a, with an A prefix. Uh, there's our reverb in and out. Reverb and vibrato pedal switchable. Uh, this thing has two... Uh, two jacks, one for an external speaker, standby and on-off switch, fuse, ground switch, very standard for Fender, and it also has a, a three-prong uh, instead of a two-prong auxiliary. Let's see what the fuse is. It's supposed to be a two-amp slow-blow fuse, and it is a slow-blow, and it is two amps. Also, this thing came with a note that says, uh, obviously it needs a 74 Fender Deluxe reverb service. The reverb has an intermittent crackling sound. The tremolo doesn't work, and it likely needs to, a recap. Uh, check the tubes and cleaning. Looks like it's never been serviced. Okay, let's go ahead and pull the chassis and get, uh, get a look inside of this thing. When servicing any of these fenders with the reverb, input and output, I usually like to label uh, one of the two, uh, input or output, so that I don't get mixed up later. It just makes it easier so I don't have to sit here and guess. Uh, so I'll label the input. One thing I might recommend is that he uh, go ahead and change this 5U4 to a GZ34. It's not going to harm the amplifier. It's going to give it a little, little, bit of extra, um, little bit of extra voltage. Um, but it's also going to draw less current on the 5 volt winding, so it might be worth uh, looking into replacing that 5U4. This one came stock with the 5U4, you can see. You can see there on the tube chart, though. Okay, so here we are inside of this thing, and I think he's right. I think this is 100% original. Um, I don't see a single thing that has been changed, in fact. All of the capacitors including those brown turds and those uh, blue drops right there those are original capacitors those Mallory capacitors those bypass capacitors are original as well there's another one there another one there we'll, we'll change all of those just as a matter of course here's the tremolo circuit he did say the tremolo circuit is not working uh, these will be the three tremolo caps here this is uh, all tremolo circuit as well. I think this is the 
uh, bypass cap in the tremolo circuit and this is the optocoupler right here and then we will have to check that to make sure that that's operational uh, that both parts of that in fact are operational the light and the resistor and like I said man yeah hundred percent original just and very clean just never been never been monkeyed with um, so this will give you a good chance to see what a what the inside of a 1974 Fender Deluxe Reverb looks like when it's uh, really clean and unmolested. We have original uh, screen resistors on the output here. We will go ahead and change those. I will probably up the value. This should be a 470 ohm. I'll up those to a 1K. Because the thing is, uh, with the way that these are oriented, uh, the tubes are upside down in these chassis, and all that heat just goes right up through the socket and into these. And uh, just being cooked and cooked and cooked over the years, these uh, resistors tend to be um, cooked to the point that they, you know, drift higher in value and, uh, you know, get closer to the point of failure. We have the original three prong power cord, and I'm not going to monkey with that at all. But yeah, if nothing else, we will go ahead. We'll check the tremolo. Uh, check and see why the reverb has some intermittent noise. He said it had intermittent noise. Clean the sockets. Uh, clean the pots. Uh, we will also go ahead and see if the uh, tubes themselves on the tube pins, sometimes those are kind of corroded and we'll have to kind of clean the tube pins a little bit. Um, and that's a very common point of failure on these as well. Like, you know, a lot of times you get intermittent um, problems from tubes and tube sockets because they're not getting good connection because over the years it's just, they've kind of just oxidized. Um, so you have to clean those. So we'll clean everything really well, clean the input jacks, and just basically give it a full once over, man. You know, check the uh, check the bias on the output before we before we move on. Uh, we probably will not test tubes unless uh, I suspect something is amiss. You know, let's got if it's got low output or something like that, or if something's not working correctly, uh, then we'll go through and start checking tubes. But other than that, I probably won't bother with checking tubes. Um, and we'll t also test the you know voltages and stuff on the output and make sure the output tubes are good. Yeah, just stuff like that, man. Just standard uh, standard stuff you would do on a on a fender. We're gonna flip this thing o over also here in a little bit and check what's under the doghouse and uh, s check what caps are under there. I'm I'm thinking if these if the none of this stuff has been replaced or serviced, those are probably original as well. I fully suspect that's the case. I think let's go ahead, actually while we have it on this side, I might as well go ahead and just replace these capacitors. I know I'm going to do that anyway. So I'll replace these, replace all of these uh, capacitors here, and replace these parts here on this output. And then we'll just kind of start from there as a baseline. We'll flip this thing over and then we'll check the doghouse and everything. That'll prevent me from having to flip this thing multiple times. Okay, so I have all of the electrolytic caps that are up here on top replaced. Uh, those two right down there, that one there, that one there, and that one there. Also, this one over here that's in the bias circuit has now been replaced. Uh, I'm also going to, like I said, go ahead and replace these um, screen resistors on this output. I'm going to do this slightly differently though. Uh, you can see this one here has been removed and this one here is still remaining. Uh, you can see how when they put these in they oriented them directly over the top of the socket. I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to come outside of the socket and uh, come around the end of the socket uh, just to keep keep it out of the path of the heat that's that rises up through this socket. Uh, it should just it's not really going to matter all that much because it's, it is going to be a metal film. Uh, but I'm leaving enough lead here so that I can mount it, you know, outside here like this. And I usually try to do that when I think of it, but sometimes I do forget and, and mount them the way that they did from the factory. Um, so that's uh, one mod that you um, probably want to go ahead and make on these if you're doing this. Uh, servicing one of these is change these 470 ohm resistors to a, a 1K. What that's going to do is it's just going to lower the, the voltage going into those screens uh, on the 6V6s and just keep from cooking the screens. Um, should make the tubes possibly last a little longer. And also it should uh, increase the uh, voltage differential between the screen and the plate and uh, might even improve uh, the output slightly. 
um, these those little uh, disc capacitors that are that are right here those are let's see what's the value of that that's a 1200 pico farad and there's one on each side uh, that's going from you can see it here you can see them there 1200 pico farads they're going from the grids of each of these output tubes to ground and what that's doing is it's um, in conjunction with this 1500 uh, ohm resistor right here that's um, uh, that's creating a low pass uh, filter and it's uh, filtering off some of the highs to ground so essentially what it's doing is it's giving this output stage um, you know it's just cleaning it up a little bit it's taking some of the junk out it's taking some of the highs out uh, it's also probably stifling this amps ability to go into overdrive you know it's it's not a huge thing but uh, I mean if you want to that's one mod that you could uh, you could make if you don't like uh, these being so stifled if you want them to have a little bit more top end sparkle uh, into that output stage you can remove those I'm gonna leave those I've been given no mandate to change the tone on this thing I've just been given a mandate to service it so but that's one uh, other mod that you can do uh, while you're in one of these a very easy one at that as far as modifications this is this is probably one of the best sounding amplifiers that Fender ever produced and the thing is uh, they really again they really did not change this model much uh, at all as a matter of fact I think between the schematics that exist that there's like three different schematics there's this one the a1172 there's another one that's uh and I don't know which of these came first. I'm not really 100% sure. There's a A1270. I'd have to say that one probably came after that last one there. And then this one was probably the older one. Uh, the AB868. Yeah, I believe it is. But the only difference is, uh, if we look down here in the reverb, uh, right there, that 220K, uh, that's a grid leak resistor, 220K coming out of this... Uh, coming out of the reverb tank into this stage right here so that 220k is on its own in this uh, AB868 but if we go to the other ones and we look at that part of the circuit we will see that there is a 2000 uh, picofarad capacitor uh, going around that 220k so there, it's in uh, parallel with it and the same can be said of the uh, the other version that we looked at there. And I've been looking, and I, I've still yet to find any differences between the uh, uh, the A1172 and this one, the uh, A1270. I've I haven't found any differences at all between those two. Uh, if you guys know what that difference is, chime in down in the comments. I'd be interested because I've I've pretty much traced this whole thing out, and I just didn't see it. Maybe I'm just stupid, but um, I didn't see any differences. So, you know, essentially there were three different uh, internal designations uh, for a deluxe reverb, but they were almost identical. The only thing I do not like about these amps is the tremolo. I do not like the optocoupler uh, style tremolo that Fender used. It's just not a very inspiring tremolo to me. I mean, this doesn't sound bad, but it, it this could have been uh, one improvement probably the the one improvement that Leo Fender could have made when he designed uh, uh, the deluxe reverb oh yeah one other thing I did forget to mention uh, on these three-way um, ground switches when you have these later uh, 70s fenders they do still have a death capacitor and it's right down here now this is a UL approved uh, death capacitor um, so it's not this isn't something that's uh, likely to fail in a way that's going to be dangerous. Uh, so I am going to leave this in. Uh, and in some situations, it's possible that it could improve uh, you know, the noise. Um, in the middle position, though, is where you generally probably want to leave these. Because if you look at the schematic, um, in the middle position is when it's completely out of the circuit. Uh, if you put it one way it's on the return side if you put it the other way it's on the hot side 
it would be a very, very freak occurrence if anything bad did happen with that in relation to that capacitor. So I am going to leave this in, uh, particularly uh, because this amp is so so mint, so cherry. I may. Um, in some circumstances consider just removing this ground switch altogether but once again you know there may be circ certain circumstances where this does actually uh, reduce noise somewhat if you're in a really noisy situation uh, in a, some kind of dive bar with you know just, um, just bad wiring you know it could, you could have situations where uh, or you have lots of interference or lots of line noise um, where that could you know just help smooth things out but um, so I, I am going to leave it, but I'm going to recommend that, uh, you know, this be left in the middle position unless you have problems and then you can try uh, switching it. But, you know, generally just leave it in the middle position where it's off. The other problem with the way they've put these on here is that they're just really hard to get off of this socket. I guess that's what they, that's what they had intended, but... I mean, shit. Can't even really change it. It's so difficult to get off. Jeez. They didn't really ever want that thing coming out of there. <clears throat> so we're actually upping it from a uh, <clears throat> a one watt. A resistor to a two watt, and we're also changing it from a carbon to a to a metal film. And again, I just like to get those kind of um, off and out of the way. Whenever I can, whenever I think about it, uh, that's the way I like to do them. Bend them uh, out of the way of the socket because that heat's going to go straight up. And if you got it right down on top of it, um, well, first of all, it's harder to get it down in there anyway. So second of all. You know, it's the you're just heating it up unnecessarily, as far as I'm concerned. So I think this is a better place to put them. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's all of the pretty much all of the modifications I wanted to do on this thing. Now I'm going to go through uh, and clean sockets and clean jacks. Uh, so, you know, we'll start with these uh, output jacks, uh, these reverb jacks back here, the center return. Those are dirty on the outside. We'll have to clean those, and uh, we'll clean all the pots and everything up front and everything here too. Okay, so what I usually like to do is just get a little uh, nylon brush. It's like a pipe cleaner brush. I uh, run it in here and uh, give it a little of the old in out in out. Uh, no time for the old in and out love. I've just come to read the meter. Good. And then while I'm at it, I like to take a little bit of uh, like 1500 or 2000 grit uh, emery cloth or sandpaper or whatever you want to call it and I like to uh, run it down in between in between these two contacts here so uh, just to kind of burnish them so that there's no chance that they uh, won't make contact because that may especially on this output because that may save your transformer so yeah, let's complete the potentiometers and the uh, rest of the jacks. I mean, really the best stuff for pots is uh, this stuff, Deoxit Fader uh, F100. Uh, I'll put a link down in the description uh, if you want to get some of this stuff. It comes in a really tiny can and it's expensive as hell, um, but you don't use very much. I mean, not even it doesn't even let you spray very much when you apply it. Here, I'll, I'll try to show you what I mean here. Just a little spritz down in each one of these. Work them back and forth, um, and it will just uh, basically lubricate these as well as clean. And that protection will last a long time. I usually don't like to promote this company just because they kind of dissed me one time. I asked them straight up. I was like, uh, well, they sent me a, an email. Uh, asking me if they could send me a care package like a you know a promotional package if I would do a video about their products and it was like you know it was like a I don't you know it would have been worth maybe eighty dollars worth of product or something like that you know which was I mean it's you know it's it's generous I guess you know in a way um, I mean they don't know 
how big of an audience I would have for a video or whatever. So, you know, maybe $80 is a fair price. I really don't know. Uh, but I shot him back, you know, a counter offer. I said, you know what, you know, I, I'm not really comfortable with doing that necessarily. I, I would much prefer uh, you guys just sponsor a few videos, you know, and I would rather work it that way and just have you guys, uh, uh, you know, pay me and I'll do some ads for you and, you know, have the same sort of effect. But you'll reach an even larger audience than if you basically just sponsored one video, you know, with a care package. But they never even email me back, not to say you know, uh, thanks for the offer, fuck you, you know, nothing. <laughs> I didn't hear anything back. So I don't know, that just kinda, when you don't hear anything back, it's it just seems, it seems like you're being dissed. I know that's not the case, I, you know, because I've been on the other end of that too, and you get busy sometimes and you don't catch all your emails or whatever. You know, I realize that that stuff happens. So it probably was nothing, but it's one of those things, you know, um, where if you're, you know, if you're a rep for a company like that and you're trying to sow the seeds of, you know, contentment and uh, goodwill and all that, all that good stuff among people you want to represent your product, it's usually best to answer, answer them back at, at the very least, you know, even if you're not down with the, with the offer. But anyway, uh, but that's the stuff that I use. And like I said, yeah, I'll put a link down in the description if you want to pick up some of that stuff and just beware. Uh, it is expensive. I mean, you see the si difference in size of the, those cans. Don't use this stuff unless you're using it on, um, you know, pots and you want to use it sparingly uh, when you do use it on pots and faders. Um, uh, use this stuff for 99% of the stuff the stuff you're going to clean though sockets all the rest of it uh, you should probably go with just regular alcohol based stuff because it's it's going to clean most things to uh, uh, a good degree because you don't need the lubricant on on most things either you know you just need a cleaner but look at the difference in size of the cans I mean this thing is about probably four times the size of that can by volume and this is I think 11 or 12 bucks and that right there is like 13 or 14 bucks so big difference and don't forget to clean and lubricate the bias pot and speaking of bias while I'm thinking about it uh, this bias cap that I replaced um, the actual bias cap that was in here was a 70 microfarad this guy or excuse me an 80 microfarad at 75 volts but the schematic actually called for a 70 microfarad uh, but I put a 100 microfarad at 160 volts and that should be just fine okay so now we're ready to flip this thing over and check out the other side and see what's under the doghouse particularly okay so here is the tube side of the chassis and uh, you can see there's several tubes here there's three six nine tubes in this amplifier uh, not a particularly large power transformer either, uh, but these all are all original transformers. You can see right there the 606, that's Schumacher transformer. Three, it's 1973, looks like 18th week. Uh, we're moving on down, that is a little choke, and it's 606 as well for Schumacher, 23rd week of 1973. And then this one here is Schumacher, 1973, 49th week. So this was made in either very late 1973 uh, or early 1974 but it couldn't it had to have been 74 because of the original speaker so the earliest it really could have been so far would be the 25th 23rd or 25th whichever that is week of 1974 oh also one more uh, transformer this one also is a 606 Schumacher, 33rd week of 73. Let's take a look at the um, tubes before we before we take a look at under the doghouse here. Uh, the first one, this is a Mesa tube, 12AX7, <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and spray out the sockets while, I, while I'm at it, while we're checking out tubes. Now that tube is not particularly old, so the pins on, on that tube are not corroded or anything. This one is a Jan Phillips uh, 5751. And uh, 5751 is basically like a 12AX7, but with slightly less gain. 
and on on these pins I like to take a I like to take a brush like this a wire brush and just kind of just kind of burnish these pins a little bit so that I'm sure that they're going to get pretty good contact This is a 12AT, but this is some kind of generic, probably European-made tube. It's a little bit of an older one, too. I'd say this is probably from the 80s or 90s, if I had to guess. Okay, this one finally is a 7025. That's the first 7025 I've run across, but this is an RCA 7025, probably an original tube. Okay, moving right down the line, we've got a uh, Russian made 7025 and again this is a fairly new tube so the pins on it are pretty clean no need to clean those we will clean the socket And finally on the preamp we have another 12AT7 and this again is a uh, generic uh, European made job I think. Okay. Alright now on to the output tubes. And we have some Russian Softex here so these are not original. We'll go ahead and Spray the sockets. Okay, and the 5U4. Now this probably is an original 5U4 to this amplifier. Uh, these almost never go bad. Um, I mean, I say that, but watch this one be bad. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're kind of a... As far as the tubes go in one of these, they tend to be a low failure tube. And you do find a lot of them with the original. A lot of old fenders will have the original rectifier tube still in them. Unless somebody has uh, intentionally gone, you know, to like a GZ34. Which, once again, that might be something we think about doing. But for now, we will leave it stock. I wasn't given a mandate to really modify this thing too much. But that is something that you could think about if you own one of these. So, okay. So, that's uh, everything pretty much cleaned up. Um, all the sockets cleaned. All the jacks cleaned and uh, all the pots cleaned. Okay, so now we're ready to lift the doghouse and see what's under there. I anticipate, if the rest of this uh, amplifier is any indication, I anticipate this being 100% original under here as well. Original Mallory's made in the USA, uh, 235, 1972, 49th week on all of these by the look of it. Yep, 72, 49th week. 16 microfarad is what these come stock with. Uh, 22 microfarad is a perfectly acceptable uh, replacement, and that's probably what we will use here. Uh, we do see right here we have what looks like, um, looks like maybe at some point one of these started physically leaking. As you can see right there, there's some crud on that it looks like it might be leaked uh, electrolyte material and we do that one there looks like it's been physically leaky that one right there has got a hole punctured in it so yeah time for these to come out for sure let's get rid of them okay here are my new capacitors and uh, I like these capacitors because they are small um, much smaller than a lot of old um, OEM capacitors that you see in, in amps like this smaller than uh, some of the other newer ones that you get more uh, high dollar capacitors 
and I use these as a standard for servicing unless someone just specifically requests uh, a higher dollar capacitor and the reason is I've had pretty good luck with these um, you know I order these from uh, antique electronic supplies uh, wholesale arm and um, they just they've always been pretty good for me so until you know I start getting a string of failures or something like that I'm gonna stick with them as a standard so um, so that's what we're gonna use to replace these again the valve we're gonna change the value from a 16 microfarad uh, to a 22 microfarad and that will be perfectly acceptable but the first thing I want to do is come in here and just clip all of these old ones out and uh, I'm just gonna leave some lead here And you also want to make a um, you know, mental note of which direction, polarity-wise, these are going. And, and the positives on this particular model uh, are all facing the same direction. They're all facing uh, this way. Uh, but just look at, look at the state of these on the ends. These just don't look, look healthy. We've got some discoloration. So that's probably been hot. We've got a little bit of a bubble forming there which I mean you get that anyway because there's a vent there but this one look at this one this one you can see is is uh, has a con has kind of a con uh, convex shape to the end of it so it's kind of bulging out on the end you can clearly see that you see how these are more flat actually they're actually bulging a little bit too but they're flat flatter than this one that one's bulging a lot same with this one. This one looks terrible. See, that one's been punctured through. Uh, and it's also really just uh, convex. It's got just a real bulge to it. Okay, these resistors, I'm going to go ahead and replace these uh, dropping resistors also while we're in here. And just like we did with the screen resistors, we're going to upgrade these resistors uh, to a higher wattage and also to a, uh, to a metal type. Another thing you really want to do while you're in one of these fenders like this is uh, while you're on this side of the chassis you want to come in here and go ahead and tighten up all of these screws uh, that are holding the you don't want to strip them out or anything but you want to tighten them as much as you can before you know before they strip because if you have one of these little transformers that's loose or something uh, it can rattle around and make all kinds of noise Okay, I've got the internal speaker plugged back in. So there's the reverb hooked up as well. So let's try it like this. I may have to pull that reverb tank. Also, another thing I like to do is, uh, if I'm getting reverb noise especially, is pull the tank and uh, clean the uh, input jacks on the tank itself. But we'll see how it goes without doing that first. So let's dial it up slowly on the Variac. We've got all these new capacitors in here, so I want to kind of bring them up slowly rather than try to shock them to life. <clears throat> oh, 
fucking thing's not even plugged in. Good God. I'm sorry, are you from the past? <laughs> Yeah, Tremolo is still completely dead, but what we do want to do is make sure, first of all, that our light is even uh, blinking. And the light is up inside of that little roach right there, and you should be able to see it blink. Um, and I don't see any kind of blinking light at all. So I would say based on that we have a dead light so first thing I want to do is just remove the entire roach I, I'm guessing that the uh, resistor is probably fine so I'll probably uh, just rewrap that same resistor with a new uh, with a new light bulb so let's just go ahead and remove the whole thing Okay, so there it is out of circuit. This is uh, what's called an optocoupler roach. All right. So here's what it looks like on the inside. And that light right there is the culprit. Pretty sure. Let's replace that and I think we'll be back in business. So here's one here. A direct replacement. I think this part number is C2A. And these are, uh, these are little neon fluorescent lights. Okay, well, now what they've done here is they've, uh, they've put wax on the end of this. And that wax was kind of insulating uh, these bare wires from one another. So what I want to do is sort of warm that up a little bit. And get my new leads down in there so that they kind of stay apart. Like so. That will be good enough. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to get some shrink tubing. Cut it to size and shrink tube this whole thing again. Okay, should be good as new. Um, now, I, you know, granted, I did not check the resistance um, on this variable uh, resistor, this photoresistor, but I don't really think that that's going to be necessary uh, because I'm pretty certain it was the light because the light was not coming on at all. We'll just go with our first instinct, and if that's not it, then we'll revisit. Now, it, it's, it is possible uh, still that it could be these, uh, these capacitors, but I definitely want to check this out and make sure first that it's not the uh, simple thing. <laughs> There was the strange reverb noise he was talking about. And again, one thing I did not do yet is uh, clean the, uh, the jacks on the tank itself. 
which could very well be at fault. Okay. So yeah, I've got nothing uh, still on that tremolo. So let's um, let's go ahead and replace the capacitors in the tremolo circuit. Let's see. Actually, you know, before we do that, let's go ahead and let's change the let's change the tube. This is a 7025 Softec. That's probably not at fault, but let's try a different tube anyway. Yeah, it's got to be those capacitors as far as that tremolo goes. So let's change those uh, change those three capacitors right there. Okay, there are those three capacitors replaced. Uh, let's go ahead and fire this thing back up and see if that took care of the problem. Uh, do you know what? That's freaking stupid. The, the tremolo needs to be shorted. Yeah, you need to turn it on. <laughs> I wasn't even thinking about that. Yeah, but yes, you have to have the foot switch for these. Light's definitely on now. Okay, so the, the oscillator is working. Hmm. Let's see. I'll tell you what, let's check voltage at this spot. Let's check uh, the voltage should be oscillating right here. And it's not. You should see a line down here on this meter kind of doing this and it's not. So I think it's I think it's actually uh it's not it wasn't the light. I think it was probably the resistor. So, we've pulled the light out of this optocoupler now and you can see the photoresistor. This is a different style photoresistor than the style that I currently have in stock. Uh, but I've got several different values in stock, so I should be able to find one that's pretty close. But I'm not really sure what the value of this one is when it's uh, at rest. When it's in complete darkness, it should have a high value. And it lowers its value as light shines upon it. So or let's see if we can get a measurement. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how much good it's going to do us. Because like I said, I think this is a bad resistor. But this leg if you notice this leg right here is really really wobbly like it's almost not not even connected okay I've got some uh, I've got some different values here's one value let's see what it does okay so this is going from like 8k when in darkness I guess down to about yeah about 400 ohms so or 10k I guess 10 or 11k I just don't know if that's high enough let's see where it is in the schematic there is our optocoupler so here's the light on this side here's the resistor and as this resistor decreases its resistance um, the signal is bled to ground depending on where we have the intensity pot. So if we have the intensity pot on high, um, you know, that is allowing more of the signal to pass through here and to go to ground. Subsequently, if we follow this back, this is getting signal from right after this coupling capacitor right here, right after that point one, and right before that 220K. So we have 50K on the intensity so I'd say, you know, already, so when that's at zero, but you, you're you going to have to have something extra uh, to keep, so I don't know, probably another 150 or so, I would guess, another 150K, maybe something like that, um, which, you know, the, again, this is just, this one I have is just 10, so I doubt this is the one we want. Uh, there's one right there labeled Ampeg Gemini. That means I have used that value right there in an Ampeg Gemini before, and that was the perfect value for that. And I would guess that probably is a very similar design, so let's check it out. 
probably what we need. All right, so in the light, it goes down to about two and a half K. And in total darkness, two meg. So it would certainly do the job. Uh, but my idea here is uh, I need to get these two pieces together. So what I'm going to try to use is uh, hot glue. Because of the awkward shape of this, I'm going to have to support it from all sides to get it to kind of work. So bear with me here while I build a... I need to build a rest for this this side of the resistor. We've got one self-contained um, part basically at this point. We just gotta shrink tube it. Might have to trim it down to make it fit. Let's do that. Let's trim it down. Thousand and one uses for hot glue. close this a little bit more. I don't know if I got that end all the way enclosed, so put another piece of shrink tubing over that. Go ahead and shrink it down a little more. Close up that end. Okay, so there's our new roach. Okay, so there's our new optocoupler installed. Let's see if it works at all. How about that? It's working fine now. Uh, the only thing we have we have left to do is figure out what's going on with that. <coughs> a little bit of noise in the background, all of which seems to be coming from the reverb. That that's got to be a tube. Okay, so I went ahead and pulled this reverb tube. Uh, that's at 12 AT7. I thought was probably a European tube. And it was, it was really hot, like way hotter than any of the other preamp tubes. So yeah, there was probably some kind of, uh, probably some kind of shorting going on, jumping between elements, and that was causing uh, uh, excess current through the tube. So replaced it, and that's perfect now. There's absolutely no more noise. So uh, I think we're pretty much done with this thing. All I need to do now is uh, just put the chassis back in, and we can give it a test. Speed is of the essence. <laughs> Thank you.
concludes our video on this 1974 Fender Deluxe Reverb. Hope you guys have enjoyed this. If you have, please click subscribe. Also click the bell to receive all notifications. And for now, y'all take care.